And I'm delighted to have you here with us for this April Meet Me at the Museum. It promised to, promises to be a wonderful program. I'm very excited about it. And we'll start in just a moment. We also have a special program coming up in May. I will show you very quickly. Palm Harbor Profile and Courage, Frank Wiener and the community stood up to the Klan in the late 70s and convinced them to leave. How did that happen? It's a wonderful story. Ed Marks from Temple Ahavat Shalom will be here with us online to discuss this man and remember him and talk about these events at that time. And that's coming up the third Wednesday night in May. In June, we have a wonderful program and we hope to be back at the museum by then in a hybrid that will be presented on the site and broadcast via Zoom as well. But the May program is still on Zoom. And with that, I hand it over to our president, Bob Fortner. Bob. Well, thank all of you for being on here and thank you for supporting the museum and, uh, and these Meet Me at the Museum programs through your memberships and contributions. We do appreciate that. And we definitely invite you to come to the museum Thursday, Friday, or Saturday from 10 to 2 and see the wonderful exhibits that we have there. And uh, if any of you get the beacon, the North Pinellas beacon, there's a nice article in there uh, by Sharon Lamb. And it talks about how the museum is a wonderful place for nostalgia, but also for education. And uh, that's what we're going to be getting some of today is the wonderful education. Thanks to our wonderful speaker that I know Joy will an announce, introduce, excuse me, in just a moment. So um, that's all I have for now, Joy. Wonderful. And I do also want to mention just briefly that we have a special program with Bluegrass on the Porch. And that's the last Saturday of April, April 30th from one to three. There's no charge for it. You can bring your lawn chairs. You can set up and just have a lovely time sitting on the patio. And you can always find out about visiting the museum on the website, palmharbormuseum.com. There's always news here. And of course, I always mention the donation page here and memberships, which are very deeply appreciated, as Bob said. So thank you so much for that. That helps sustain us. And with that, I'm going to get started with our program. Of course, this is Earth Month, but we are also going to learn something really unusual that many of us may not know about. Longtime educator, speaker, artist, who combines it all. He combines his love for the environment with his love for teaching and his love for art. You can see his book at the top of this flyer, Ice Age Florida, in story and art. But there's much more on his website as well. It is wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us for this program. We're thrilled to have you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. I'm just going to do the share screen. Please tell us more about yourselves yeah. and your work. Yes, okay. I was born in 1945, and during that time, uh, women in America uh, weren't really part of the scientific community as much as they should have been. A matter of fact, a lot of times they were discouraged from higher education. The program I'm going to offer today, in 1945, these ideas just wouldn't have existed, just absolutely wouldn't have existed. The world that that was uh, thought that the continents were permanently in the positions they were in. They didn't understand anything about plate tectonics or earthquakes or mountain building or a chain of volcanoes. They didn't understand any of these things. All of it's been a lot of work and a lot of time that a lot of people have put in to make this a really special thing. Uh, I'd like to start out talking about Alfred Wagener. He was actually a polar explorer and in Greenland, and he did all kinds of wonderful things as far as using weather balloons to try to discover the way the winds were blowing and did ice cores. When I started out and opened up my first geology book, 
what it said about him was that he was a, a German artilleryman, which, which I haven't been able to find any evidence of that, but uh, during the First World War, and he came out with the idea of continental drift. Well, I have, to, I have to tell you that his story is much deeper than that. He was actually a polar explorer and a, and a geophysicist and all kinds of things. The man had a lot of credentials behind him. He did three expeditions into the heart of Greenland. And on the fourth expedition, he was doing a rescue. And he went way deep in to a, a weather station and brought supplies, very needed supplies. Uh, those people were just not going to be able to, to live very much longer in that station uh, without the materials that he was bringing. And after he brought the supplies in, he realized that he hadn't brought enough to where he could live and the uh, people of the weather station would be able to live off of the supplies that he brought. So he decided to, with a companion to leave and try to go back to the nearest village well, the temperature outside was minus 70 degrees below zero. It was a really chilly day, and he didn't make it. But his ideas are what's important. You know, when we're talking about the Ice Age, we have to realize that it's the geography, it's the motion of the plates that really are putting so much of the Ice Age together. Uh, one of the other people I'd really like to mention is Malutin Milenkovic. He's a, a, an astronomer and a mathematician, and he decided that the rotation of the Earth and the uh, orbit of the Earth around the Sun had something to do with the Ice Ages. Now, he published his work in 1941, and it just so happened that the printer that he chose was in Yugoslavia, and the Germans were bombing Yugoslavia, and they bombed the printer where his original work was. And it all would have burned up. But luckily there was an another copy in a warehouse uh, at some distance that didn't get hit. But that's, that's the way this works. That's the way science works. Uh, it's all these people. Both, what's wonderful now is both men and women. Uh, it's wonderful that all these people have come together and worked so hard, devoted their entire lives to coming up with these ideas that I'm going to share with you today. So uh, I think it's a good idea if we can get started now. And of course, the image that you're seeing, that's Tampa Bay, what Tampa Bay would have looked like around 15,000 years ago. This is what America would have looked like, the U.S. would have looked like back 18,000 years ago. Uh, it was massive. You know, when you think about it, what I also want you to think about is the shape of Siberia and the shape of uh, all the, the material up north, all the landscapes way up north, and how all of that can hold ice. And that was, that's the real problem, is that there was so much landscape around the, the North Pole that ice could really form very easily. But the question is, is why, why did we have an ice age? What's that all about? Uh, there, were, there were mountains of ice that were two miles thick. You know, uh, just an amazing amount of ice that reflected sunlight in the northern hemisphere. And of course, reflected sunlight means that you've got a, a process of cooling. But this, this to me is the real key, is uh, the isthmus about 2.5 million years ago, the isthmus of Panama closed up so that the northern equatorial current on the Atlantic Ocean couldn't no longer go through to the Pacific Ocean. And it had to turn back on itself. And we call that, today we call that the Gulf Stream. And I find it very interesting that there's so much rain in Britain. And how many times do we think of it, that, that rain actually comes from us, that Gulf Stream, that warm current that goes all the way up the coast, starts way down near Florida, and goes up the coast. That Gulf Stream produces that amount of moisture. Why is that important? Well, if you're going to have if you're going to have snow and ice, you have to have precipitation, and so that's a big part of how this works. Is is when when that t uh, tide, when that current was cut off, then this could begin. Now, Malutin Milenkovic, he 
had this wonderful idea that when he studied the motion of the Earth, that the Earth had a difference in of 23 degrees, 23.44 degrees, uh, in the axis of the Earth, so that the Earth doesn't isn't straight on to the Sun. It's it's off a little bit. And if you see the, in the graphic here, you can see that this is basically winter time in the north because uh, the Earth is tilted away from the north. Uh, the other thing that Milankovitch d discovered was that the Earth goes through p periods of where it's circular, very, very close to being circular around the sun, and then it goes into an elliptical orbit. And when it goes into the elliptical orbit, actually it has a tendency to cool down. So when these ice age, when the ice age happened, uh, one of the big things is that it drew a tremendous amount of water out of the Earth's oceans. And so it dropped the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean and Pacific Ocean over 300 feet. So a lot more of Florida was out of water. One of the things you want to notice on this map is where we are today, if you can kind of spot where Tampa Bay is on the drawing and think about where we are today, that was a real uplands community. The real heavy forests would have been much further along the coast. And so this is a good idea about how dry Tampa Bay was. Uh, the, the, there was a river, and I call it the Hillsborough River for the lack of any other idea, that was 110 feet under modern Cabbage Key. Uh, that's where the Pinellas Bayway is today. And what we'll do is when we start this journey out, uh, we're going to start it out in late autumn and early winter. And the reason for that is because that's when Florida is really active. During the summer months, it was very, very dry. But what's going on at this time is the cold fronts coming down from up north. We would have occasional snow flurries, but it would never hold. It would never even hold up till 12 o'clock. But the cold fronts coming down from up north would cause the warm fronts coming up from the tropics to lift, and it would lift into real heavy cloud cover, and then it would begin to rain. So this was the rainy season. The winter was the rainy season at that time in Florida. Uh, one of the animals that we had here that's very, very common, its fossils are very, very common, is giant gopher tortoises. I mean, these things are big. You could ride on top of that critter. We find a lot of fragments of its shell, and the osteoderms are these scales that you see along the legs. Those also get preserved very often. But that animal tells you absolutely for sure that we didn't have a really, really frozen winters. That could have, that, uh, that's a reptile, and it could have never uh, put up with that kind of thing. Now, the neat thing about the winter or the autumn is so many things blossom. I mean, this is uh, the spikes of a blazing star, and I think it's interesting that there's a bee in this. And here are the blossoms of Carphophorus. That's one of the big, one of the biggest times in Florida for blossoming. I mean, all these plants come alive because the rains are, were very, very constant in those times. Now, one of the things about these Carphophorus, these purple heads that you're seeing on the screen is uh, green link spiders love to hide underneath them. They're a big kind of woolly looking spider and any kind of insect or bee or something like that that lands on them, uh, they're a fair game. But there was lots of different kinds of flowers blooming at this time. Uh, here we go, we got a, uh, a deer being chased by uh, a cheetah-like cat through a field of Coreopsis. And it just kind of reminds you that all of this, all of this greenery is just bursting forth. So all the herds of different kind of animals are coming down from up north and moving into Florida. They're like winter visitors are today. And one of them would have been the giant bison. Now, we're familiar, there was two kinds of bison that came to Florida. One of them was uh, bison bison, that's the bison that we're all familiar with today. And then there's this guy, and this is bison latifrons, and it's a little bit more robust, and those horns are much wider. And the horns tell us that 
Now this is an animal that was going through jungle. This is an animal that was out on the prairies. And so Florida was very open. The area that we're in, living in in Florida, would have been very, very open prairie. And of course mammoths. Now mammoths are, are capable of eating a fort, 400 pounds of grass and vegetation every day. And so they would have come down, I think that they were probably migrating in, mostly migrating in to Florida over autumn and winter. And uh, they were joined by horse and they were joined by the bison. And uh, they were eating a tremendous amount uh, because they were forming huge herds. I mean, the herds had to be just magnificent. And what they were depositing on the other side was fertilizer. And a lot of times when we look at prehistoric Florida, we don't want to realize that uh, there's something going on here with uh, what animals are discharging at the same time. And that's really increasing the quality of a very, very sandy soil. Uh, the saber-toothed cat. I really believe that this was probably an autumn or winter visitor, but this is the perfect environment for these kind of cats. When we look at them, we think, oh my gosh, look at those fangs. Uh, that's, that's just terrifying. But what's kind of interesting is with the saber-toothed cat, when we find the fossils of the saber-toothed cat, very often one of those uh, fangs has been broken off. They're delicate. They're not something that you'd want to use on, say, uh, the vertebral column of a bison or something like that. What I believe went on is that a few of these cats would uh, imitate the American lion. The American lion was a big cat living down here in Florida. And I think these guys would kind of put their head down and wander towards a herd of bison or horse. And as that herd began to move, then they'd chase that herd in a direction. And that was a trap. Because in the other end of that direction that they were running uh, would have been other saber-toothed cats waiting to spring that trap. And what they would do is they would leap up cut the throat of an oncoming bison and swing away as fast as they could to get out of the way of those pound, pounding hooves. And I think that's the way they were hunting. And I think these were always pack hunters. They were always cooperating with each other. Now, this is a, this is a short-faced bear. This, this thing is tremendous. About 12 feet tall. Okay, so imagine a bear standing over you 12 feet tall. That's a big bear. And it weighed in at 200 or 2,200 pounds. There's a lot of discussion between the experts on whether this actually was a, an animal that hunted down other animals, a predator, or whether it was a scavenger. And I have to tell you, for, for my money, I think this was everything that this, that this thing is described by tells me that this is a predator. Recently, though, a lot of studies are showing that it also ate uh, berries and vegetation as well. But it was the biggest bear that ever lived in North America. Ah, now this would have been a regular visitor to our area. Uh, this is a, it looks like a camel and it's a llama-like animal and it would have lived here all year long because it could have survived when this thing became really desolate. Yeah, the males would have picked the highest knoll in the area and kind of made sure that their females stayed around that. And it would have also included some kind of a little sinkhole or something where they were able to get a little bit of water during those really brutally hot summer months that it, where all of this area dried up. Uh, this, is a, this is the American lion. We don't often think of lions like you see in Africa as being part of Florida's environment, but they were, and they were bigger than the African lion, more robust than the African lion. Uh, one of the most common fossil animals that we find in Florida is the horse. Horse fossils, I mean, uh, my, my wife Elizabeth, she's from Canada. She was only down here for, uh, I guess, out, out with me for about two, three weeks when she we went to a restaurant, and there next to the parking lot along the shoreline next to this parking lot, she picked up a fossilized horse tooth. Uh, that's how common these animals were. There must have been huge, I mean, really vast herds of horses in Florida uh, during that time. 
Ah, an early morning scene. Uh, the sun has just ri risen, and what you've got is you're on Panela's Peninsula, and you're looking down towards that uh, stream, the river that goes past here. Uh, overnight, a group of dire wolves, these are wolves that are about the same size, just a little bit larger than our modern forest wolves are, are but they had jaws that were incredible. They were just amazing strength in their teeth, amazing strength in their jaws. Now, these were bone crunchers, bone breakers. And they brought down a horse overnight and are feeding on that. And, and this is a, a mom, and she's got her cubs with her. Well, a, a short-faced bear, remember, that's a big guy. A short-faced bear is picked up on the scent of what those wolves brought down and is looking to get a little bit of food out of it for himself. In the meantime, there's a herd of mammoths that are wandering down towards the river. Now, the female, she's, it's the matriarchy, and so she's in charge of the whole thing. And she's not comfortable with the growling of the wolves and the snorting of the bear. And so she's coming up to investigate, is everybody in her tribe, in her herd, are they all safe? And as soon as she finds out that everybody's doing okay, she'll turn around and join her her herd again and head back down to the river. Why well, this is a cheetah-like cat. We we saw one before, but I didn't really get a chance to talk much about it. Uh, this thing, the body, the the bones, everything really looks very cheetah-like. I mean, the structure of it, uh, the anatomy, the bone anatomy is amazingly cheetah-like. But there's a lot of problems with looking at it as genetically the same as modern cheetah. Apparently it wasn't. But they were fairly common down here. If you're starting to count the cats, we had a bunch of them. Uh, big cats and really rugged, rugged cats. All right, this is a, this is a glyptodon. This is a, about as tall as a, as a, well, a small car, uh, something like a little Volkswagen. Uh, they're big and bulky. This critter, when it walked through the forest, it didn't worry about any making any sound or anything being attacked by anything. It had a very strong, powerful shell. Uh, I, what I'd like to point out and have you notice is that in front, uh, it has a like a little uh, trunk, uh, a, a, an upper lip that's prehensile. They get to crash through the underbrush, and my guess is that occasionally uh, some poor cat would really get startled by this creature that just didn't care, just would crash around wherever it went. Uh, this giant sloth. Uh, remember, all these animals were living where we are today. And again, I created this sloth with a prehensile upper lip. Uh, in other words, a much extended upper lip. Most of the studies that I've seen, most of the anatomy I've seen, all seems to cut the lip off right with the bony structure at the very end of the mouth. But most of these animals, when you really think about it, they were reaching up and they were pulling down branches and pulling off leaves. And so as far as I can see, um, it would have been an absolutely natural thing for them to have a, a upper lip that was prehensile. This thing stood uh, 20 foot tall. It was massive. And a matter of fact, it's larger in body size than mammoths were. This is a big, big animal. They seem to have lived in groups. Instead of living singularly, uh, it seemed to be to their advantage to have a, a group of them so that anything attacking them, uh, one could go after it and the other ones could defend themselves. Those huge front claws uh, seem to me to be something that uh, I could resist bothering. Now, this is a young Young Arimatherium, that's the name of this giant ground sloth, it's, it's an Arimatherium. This particular animal was found in Naples and they've got almost the entire skeleton there. It's a juvenile, it's a young animal. And what I really enjoyed about it is uh, the way their display was. I could really kind of get up and photograph its anatomy. And so I took a lot of time to try to uh, rebuild some of that. Ah, this is the animal in front is a capybara. The capybaras are one of the biggest rodents in the world, and they love to live near watery areas. As a matter of fact, they'll pick out, if you have a stream and you have islands in the stream, they'll pick out the islands to live on. 
and jaguars like to live in the same deep forest. We've come down now from the prairie, from the high prairie. We've come way down to the deep forest now. And so you find jaguars here. It's interesting that in Miami, uh, Bob Carr, the archaeologist in Miami, when he was doing an excavation, he found a lot of evidence of a lot of fossil material from jaguars. So we had quite a large population of jaguars. The capybara also tells you that there has to be a lot of water around it in order for it to survive. And I'm going to finally get to an animal that I think uh, produced that, created that, those ponds. These are a little group of peccary. Now, they're like pig-like, but they're really not. They're native to the Americas. When they get frightened, and they always, always hang out in troops, uh, actually, I experienced that when I was in Central America. Uh, there was a group of, they are called large, uh, giant peccaries uh, that we came in contact with. And there's something you don't really want to, uh, you want to be very thoughtful around them and make sure that you don't get between them and their, their young ones because it can be very aggressive. But these are, this is a smaller collared peccary that was common here. And what they would do is uh, if something threatened them, like a lion or, or a wolf or something, uh, they would all get together and they would gnash their uh, fangs, their, their big tusk-like teeth that they have right in front. And it's, a, it's an awful sounding kind of thing. It really lets you know that they're not happy with you being there. Uh, this spectacled bear. Now, this bear uh, doesn't live anywhere but in South America now. But in those days, in the days of the Ice Age, the last Ice Age, this bear was living right here where we live. And that's pop ash. In the background, the trees that you're seeing, that's pop ash. It's a kind of a swampy environment where the, the short-faced bear is in the same family. It's the same family as the spectacled bear. Where that thing was 2,250 pounds, the spectacled bear weighs in at about 440 pounds. So it's a lot smaller. And it's generally about 15% of its diet is grubs and, and insects and little small animals that it can catch. Most of its diet is all plant food. Now this is a giant armadillo. Uh, if I was standing up straight, at, say I, uh, I'm a little bit less than six foot now, this thing would have come up to my chest. So it was a much bigger armadillo. Now, the, the experts, I find it kind of interesting, the experts really want to talk about it uh, digging up worms and grubs and uh, things like that, uh, roots and all. I just, and snakes even. And I have a, such a hard time with that. You don't see these very often anymore, but I think during that time in prehistory, I think that if they were very common that there were these yellow jacket nests underground. And there were also bumblebee nests underground. Now, they, they still happen. When you get out in Florida's forest, you can run into yellow jackets and bumblebees that are living underground, and especially when you're getting around palmettos. And I think that's one of the big things that this thing was eating. If you've ever experienced one of these yellow jacket nests, I can tell you they're absolutely huge. And one of the fossils that I found that I think was this is very, very interesting is actually part of a yellow jacket nest that's fossilized. And the uh, darn thing about it is, I don't know where I put that darn thing. I've been trying to find it, but so far I've, I've been, uh, I've got a lot of stuff to go through to, to bring that back. But for the longest time, I couldn't understand what this fossil was because it didn't look like anything else that I'd ever found. But this is the giant armadillo. Just like there's deer today, there were deer back then. And this deer is actually not in the right place. It's down towards the water's edge and it's laying down. That probably wouldn't have been a very good thing for a deer in those days. Uh, a lot of hunters, a lot of hunters down by the water's edge. But this is kind of a glade that it's in, so probably it was would have been okay. But so not only were there animals that really looked absolutely different than the animals that we see today, there were animals that looked very similar. And one of the animals I think that hunted deer very commonly was that uh, uh, cheetah-like cat. And here, we, we recognize this, this raccoon, right? 
but it was only one of many, many, many kinds of animals that were that size that still live today. Uh, cotton, cotton rats, and voles, and mice, and uh, also, uh, what is it, muskrat. Muskrat was common here. We find muskrat fossils, and squirrels. Squirrels are a common fossil. And we also want to remember that there were plenty of bats. I've found bat fossils. And a matter of fact, one of the bat fossils here was what's called a, a giant, uh, what do they call that, a vampire, giant vampire bat. And, but there were all kinds of bats here. And the other thing is there were birds and bird fossils show up as well. Uh, there were night herons and, and uh, uh, let's see, egrets, all kinds of different bird fossils. Now this is a mastodon. And you, you wonder, why wouldn't I put them with the mammoths, you know, so that we got kind of a comparison. It's smaller. It's really smaller than a mammoth. These guys live near the water. They would have gone towards ponds or any place like that where it was really a wetlands. That's what they liked, and they liked to eat the vegetation along the uh, water's edge. This is a taper. Now today, of course, they're in South America. They're not in North America at all. But uh, before I left Boyd Hill, that's Lake Magori, in South St. Petersburg, uh, we found a piece of fossilized taper jaw, the upper jaw of a taper that came out of Lake Magori. So these were very, very common. I found quite a bit of uh, taper material, especially up around the Akron College area and the Bayway, a lot of taper material. And they are water loving. They have to have water that they live by. They, they hide during the daytime, mostly they hide in water. And of course, alligators. Uh, you know, Florida is, I guess, kind of famous for alligators. People like alligators. The males grow to be 14 feet and a little bit better. The females only grow to 6 feet, and we get this wrong very often. It's not the big male alligators that are really the threatening things. The big male alligators have one big purpose in life, and that's to try to keep the females from harming each other. The females are the nest builders. And because they are very, very territorial, they'll build a nest. They don't want another female to come around that nest. That's her nest. And so if another female comes around, uh, they can get into some very vicious fights. I've actually witnessed uh, <laughs> incredible fights between female alligators. But the big males, that's what they do. They get in there and break that fight up. And one time, one of the things I saw uh, an alligator do that I thought was kind of interesting is a, a, a larger female approached the nest of a smaller female, and she had alligators that were probably about uh, six or eight months old already with her. And this, the, the other female had just hatched out brand new, brand new nestlings, it's little tiny little baby alligators. Right, and the two of those women, they just got into an awful fight and rolled around and made a lot of noise. And finally, the bigger alligator got enough of it and said, I'm out of here. And what she left behind was all of her, her babies, her larger babies. And what was really funny about it, I think was interesting, was that all of them got together. The, the mother greater that remained, the small, tiny little babies, and the larger babies all got along fine and seemed to just kind of get along together. But alligators would have been common in this area as, as well. Now this is a giant beaver. Uh, if you could uh, walk up to it, it would have been waist high, much bigger than modern beavers are. The scientists and uh, scholars, they, they seem to want to talk about this beaver as not being like modern beavers in that it would uh, build dams and things like that. And I disagree, absolutely. Uh, Florida, when the, when, the, when the spring and the summer came, Florida became a real, very hot, desolate place on the interior where we are, where we live today. That would have been a really, really hot place. And I think what these things were doing, they're they much more robust, much bigger, and I think what they were doing is they were piling up not only a lot of sticks and, and brush, but they were piling up a lot of dirt as well. And they were ponding, they were creating ponds. You know, we've got uh, the, the gentleman that I worked with on the book, Bob Cinebaldi. Uh, he's actually found uh, remains from giant beavers 
in the Peace River. So we know that they're that far south. And my feeling is, is that what they're doing is they're building large ponds that over the summer months are dry, will dry out and dry out and dry out. And finally, the only thing that will be in the pond, which has gotten very, very small, will be the home of that beaver where those beavers were living. And so this animal provided a place for capybara. It provided a place for tapir. It provided a place for all the water-loving animals that really needed that kind of an environment. Uh, one of the things you want to notice about it is, unlike modern beavers, it doesn't have a wide, flat tail. It has a very narrow tail, well, a kind of rat-like tail. But uh, uh, I think that it's what's called a keystone species because it took care of so many other animals. And of course, during the height of the winter season, when this the river that went right along Pinellas, when it was at its, its deepest, it would have been very attractive to manatees. Manatees would have been swimming up that river because it was warmer than the oceans outside. And so we'd have seen plenty of manatees in this area, in the, in the river. Now, this is a giant condor. And just on the other side, the Bradenton side of Tampa Bay, uh, when in the Lycee pit, where they discovered so much fossilized material, they discovered the fossils of giant condor as well. And that's exciting that these animals were here. But I think what's even more exciting is they found a whole flock of cormorants that had died. And with the cormorants, the fossilized material with the cormorants, in the area that the cormorants, where their stomach was, they found a tiny little uh, animal, microorganism, that is associated always with red tides. And the theory is, is that these birds made a mistake and ate fish that were being affected by the red tide and it poisoned this whole flock of, of birds that died just on the other side of Tampa Bay. Uh, this is the migratory time. This is when uh, springtime would have occurred and these animals are going to be heading up towards the Midwest. Now, the Midwest isn't the Midwest we know today. It wasn't just open grasslands. It was mostly uh, meadows and forests, spotty, spotty forest. And so the, we're looking at what Tampa Bay would have looked like. And it's just, it's just a kind of a rolling countryside. This is what uh, Europe would have looked like underneath the glaciation. Notice the huge lakes along the glacial margins. Here is Africa, and what I want you to notice is Africa back during the Ice Age was much greener than Africa is today. And of course we're looking for that one animal that's going to be coming out of Africa that is us, uh, the American Indians, and when they came across. This shows the plates that make up the Middle East. And what you want to notice is this is the collision between major plates, five major plates, and it's just created a whole lot of mountain chains. It's a very, very, very rugged countryside that we expect that our uh, forefathers kind of stumbled through. The valleys were beautiful. The valleys would have been very lush and given them a tremendous amount of food and energy, but the mountains, trying to get families across those mountains must have been a rigorous thing. My theory is that I, I believe that what they were doing is the first people out of Africa probably would have headed along the coast uh, going east and entered India. Only later, slowly, over time, would our people have begun moving up into the Russian steppes. Uh, on their way, they were uh, visiting with Neanderthals and also Denisovans. Um, now, the, it's a Neanderthal woman on one side, and that's a reconstruction I did, and a, a modern Siberian on the other side. We think of them as uh, being primitive, uh, wearing clothes like they wrap around their waist. I don't think that's true at all. Uh, they, in the Denisovan cave 41,000 years ago now, they found a, a bone needle. And so these people were already sewing. And it makes sense, you know, when you're in a very cold climate, because the world was the northern part of the world was really in cold climates. And so it would have made sense for them to take furs off of animals 
and, and we know that Neanderthals used their teeth. We got tools that Neanderthals used to um, clean these skins and make them pliable. And so the women would have been sewing beautiful clothes with the fur on the inside, not the outside, right? Because when the fur is turned to the inside, it really adds additional insulation. Uh, this is one of the animals that they would have been hunting in that area. This is Saga antelope. They would have joined huge herds of reindeer in Europe and the European buffalo and horse and woolly mammoths. Now this is my feeling and you know these are these are my ideas. Eh, nobody has to go along with them but I think this is the route that uh, the early people took. They didn't go over the Bering Strait. I think they took the Aleutian Islands. The largest, the widest point is 50 miles from Kamchatka uh, out into the Pacific Ocean. It's 50 miles between there and Commodore Island. And once you get to Commodore Island, it's one island after another. Now sitting on uh, Kamchatka, the first people would have looked out in the, the, the darkness of the Pacific Ocean at night and they would have seen volcanoes in the distance towards the east. And I think those were calling cards. Those volcanoes told them that there was island after island after island. What you want to imagine is this is an amazingly rich environment as far as food goes. There were sea otters and sea lions and walruses. I mean, hunting out there would have been incredible. It would have been just absolutely fabulous for those early people. And when they came to the Americas, this is what it looked like. You know, we hear scientists talk about what's called the ice-free corridor. That's the corridor that connects Canada and uh, the Bering Strait with the rest of North America. But notice that there's a massive lake in there. It's Lake Agassiz. And that lake would have never allowed anybody to get through. I mean, this is a huge lake. And so I really believe they were a coastal people and they were coming down the Pacific coast. Now, they lived little lives and they moved slowly and they did only what was comfortable. I mean, they wanted to stay alive and they wanted to live well. There's a lot of scholars that seem to point to the dates in South America and say, well, you know, here's the earliest dates. As though when these people got o over the Bering Strait and, or over the Aleutian Islands and into the Americas, they just sprinted all the way down the coast as fast as they could to get to Terra del Fuego at the very tip of South America. That just didn't happen. I mean, that's, uh, that's very imaginary. These people moved slow. These dates that are coming out of South America, notice South America is a very different South America then, 18,000 years ago, than it is today. Uh, the, the, the jungle wasn't nearly as large as it is today. Remember, water levels are down, so you're not going to get the kind of rains you need there in order to produce those kind of jungles. But the early people uh, moved very slowly through these environments because uh, there were big animals that we've never, we've seen them. They'd eat you. Now this is an atlatl, and when the atlatl came into being, uh, that would have given uh, humans an advantage. Uh, that would have been an equality with the best and the biggest hunters in all of the um, Americas. I mean, that's cave bears or short-faced bears and all the rest of them. And here's a group of Clovis hunters that are taking a, a mastodon down. Ah, there it is. Breakfast, right? This is a Clovis point. Uh, you've seen this in the display. Uh, this this isn't an actual Clovis point. I've got a friend that is capable of making them. Uh, they're very hard to make, very difficult to make, and he's very good at it. And uh, I got him to trade me for the picture that you just saw uh, with the people around the dead carcass. I actually traded that picture for this. Uh, Point, so I could show you what a Clovis point looked like. They were, there was an amazingly powerful tool that created an equality between all the humans that were living here and the animals too. This is South St. Petersburg and this is what I think Lake Megory was like. A lot of, a lot of ferns, a lot of wet environment and you see the, the giant uh, bison in it and the mammoth, mammoth coming through. And Lake Megory would have been a sinkhole. As a matter of fact, there were a lot of lakes all along T Tampa Bay, freshwater lakes, and they were all sinkholes. They were all connected by underground. And so we, let's go back to Lake Agassiz. It was a massive lake, and when it broke loose, 
and it broke loose a lot of different times. It wasn't just one flood that this lake caused, but the, one of the biggest floods came down the Mississippi Valley. And actually, the upper Mississippi Valley, it sloshed past uh, where the break is that for the lower Mississippi Valley. And then it rushed back down the Mississippi Valley, and it carved out a valley that's 100 miles wide in areas. I mean, this was one of the most magnificent floods you could ever have imagined. Now, this is a good example of how big that thing is. If you notice, uh, the Great Lakes, well, they're really small in comparison. And so animals that were caught in that flood, people that were caught in that flood, anything that was caught in that flood just died out. You know, we wonder, we have to wonder, what happened? What happened to all the animals? They all seem to die out. You know, at one point, it's called the Younger Dryas, and it's 12,000, about 12,900 years ago, the Younger Dryas happened. And the Younger Dryas trigger, something that caused the Younger Dryas to happen, uh, was it that breakout of that flood? Now, we think that, a lot of people think that, uh, scholars, that when that flood occurred, it brought so much fresh water down that it could have actually covered the entire surface of the Gulf of Mexico. When the water, when that fresh water tipped Florida, it began pushing the Gulf Stream down and it stopped the Gulf Stream from continuing north. Now this is another theory and I happen to think that this is a good idea as well. I think what we need to look at is the Younger Dryas trigger was the perfect storm. Uh, I think that there was a comet that was passing Jupiter and it had struck by an asteroid at the same time and Jupiter's gravity, the, as Jupiter was retreating, gra the Jupiter's gravity spread that, the chunks of that comet out. And you know, when we see uh, like the Perseid meteor shower, when you see the Perseid meteor shower and you go out there and you watch the, uh, the little uh, shooting stars go by, well, actually, what that is, is that's the remains from a comet that passed a long time ago. And so the remains stay up there in the sky, in, the, in space. And so every time the Earth passes through there, every year that the Earth passes through, bang, we're, we're back in it again. We get the, I know, I'm supposed to wind this up. Elizabeth is giving me a message. We get, we get a meteor shower. I'm almost done. And... Uh, what I think happened is that this comet, when, when we hit it, and we only hit it a little bit uh, on one edge of the Earth, uh, the stuff that came down was just horrific. And there was massive explosions. And the mammoths, the mastodons, giants, slows, tapers, all of that stuff was simply wiped out. And forests just burned. I mean, there's a thing called the black mat uh, that archaeologists find, and it's just areas where it's just a layer of burnt out material. And who also disappeared during that Younger Dryas trigger was the Clovis culture. They went extinct. Here in North America, they were gone. But what's kind of interesting is recently we're finding that the genetics of the Clovis culture and the uh, Mayan people are very, very similar, so there may have been something to that. I've had a lot of American Indians tell me that their people didn't come from the north. You know, we were always talking about the Bering Strait and the Aleutian Islands, and things like that. they go, no, 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 our people didn't come from that way, they came from the south. And it makes sense, if they got wiped out in the northern part of America, then they would have returned from Central America and South America. That's it. This is all so fascinating, and I and I hate that you had to rush through. I see that you had many, many materials, but it's just been an amazing discussion. And, of course, um, I know that there must be questions for you, and I am putting in the chat your website because there's lots of information there. There are materials that you've written, a great deal of history from way, way back, uh, to the present day, and there's also quite a few of the pictures as well. Tell us about Elizabeth, because I know that she's so important in what you do as well, and of course she was helping you with this presentation. Elizabeth, uh, my wife, uh, we met, there she is, uh, 
we met about uh, 28, 30? 30 years ago, 30 years ago now. <laughs> and uh, she was interested in all kinds of things too uh, about Florida. You know, the thing is, is you look at Florida and it looks so flat, so nondescript, and you know, mainly a, a large beach and a sand dune. But the truth of it is, is Florida's history is some of the most fabulous history in all of the world, literally in the world. It's a very, very strange piece of property that doesn't even belong to North America, actually. Florida's, all the basement geology in Florida is um, African. And so Elizabeth and I got really interested in it, and Elizabeth became very involved in portraying uh, Florida history, really and ended up in love with Florida history. Recently, Elizabeth has returned to her roots, you might say, to her heritage, and she's gotten involved in a lot of fabric art. But uh, you're right. Uh, actually, tonight, um, you may have noticed I I'm, um, uh, I've got a lot of asthma all the time, and uh, Elizabeth has to help me through a lot, and she does. She really makes sure that I'm doing okay, and so she did wonderful tonight to try to help me through a lot of this stuff. And I thank her very much for that. You say hello, Elizabeth. Come here. Hi there. <laughs> there she is. This is my wonderful Elizabeth. My main interest has been women's history, starting with with the Spanish conquistadors. People for, don't realize that women came here too. And then the Pompeo de Navias expedition that came into Tampa Bay in 1528, there were 10 women in that expedition. And we know that they were there, just don't work, you know, the guys get all the PR and the women are kind of shoved in the background and, you know, we have babies and cook meals. No, there's a lot more. Oh, uh, yes. I know we have questions and I have some, but I would like to open the floor to anyone who would like to ask a question. I always thought that Florida was probably underwater at one time. Uh, how has the landscape evolved over time? Well, uh, it's a big story. I mean, <laughs> it's gotten into a big story. When you, you know, the, the he has a program on Florida geology only. Oh, <laughs> You'll right. have to come back and do that one. I'll bet. Yeah, the um, the Gulf of Mexico is the elephant in the room. Uh, that's where. Uh, the spreading zone for uh, the entire world's continents is. That was the Gulf of Mexico. Africa was part of, you know, it's, it's Pangaea. So Africa was part of North America and South America. They all formed one huge continent. And when that broke up, Florida was a mountain chain. Uh, where you see the end of the mountain chain is in Brazil uh, today. That's it today but it was a massive mountain chain that this would have been. When it broke up, well, those mountains slowly were eroded down, and finally the Atlantic Ocean opened up, and those mountains went underwater. And for a tremendous amount of time, Florida was made out of five chunks, not out of a, out of a single chunk, but made out of five chunks that was slowly shoved over towards North America. And there's still a joint that you can see uh, if you all go on Google Earth, uh, and look up at toward the panhandle, you'll see a massive canyon up there called the Soto Canyon. And it's the suture line. It's the place where the major crack went right across from Florida all the way up through Georgia. And one of the areas of that that didn't quite come together with North America is the Okefenokee Swamp. That's what the Okefenokee Swamp actually describes, is a hole in that joint. Uh, the other place that's similar to that is Lake Okeechobee. Uh, Lake Okeechobee is part of the pieces that didn't quite come together uh, when Florida was shoved all together, that, the Florida that you see today. Wow. But, yeah, it was, it was underwater, above water, underwater, above water, over and over again. Where you are right now, where you all are sitting right now, you can figure that there's a mile deep of limestone. That's all made out of shell material or uh, grasses, sea grasses that were uh, that had a lot of calcium carbonates in them, lime lime materials, and so that's what Florida is primarily made out of. The stuff I'm talking about, the deep geology from Africa, that's a mile underneath of where you're sitting. So that's what Florida is about. I mean, 
you're living in one of the most incredible pieces of property on the planet Earth. I can tell you that for sure. I have to share that uh, when Herman and I got married 30 years ago, we had uh, we were flying into Nova Scotia, oh, yeah. and he pulled out his geology book and said, "Hey." You know, I want to go to this place and that place because they were formed the same time as uh, Florida. And I said, yes, dear, we're going to go meet my parents. <laughs> One thing at a time. That's right. <laughs> we were there to meet her parents. I was there for a geology expedition. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to comment that, uh, again, thank you Herman and Elizabeth for facilitating the use of your uh, beautiful artwork but in addition the incredible help that you gave us when we were under a very short deadline to prepare our exhibit environmental alterations and I'm glad to get to share publicly with everyone here that uh, Herman and Elizabeth were just essential to helping us uh, get that done in a timely manner. And so when you get to come to the museum again, please take some time. And now that you've seen and heard from Herman, you'll realize why I just am, I just think you knocked it out of the park, Herman. I'm just wanting to do nothing but just learn more and more and more. And so how do we get your book? And uh, please, will you, you know, come see us at the museum sometime so we can visit with you and have a program in person. Well, we obviously have a geology program we've got to do here. So Yay, <laughs> 2023. yeah, we have a lot of programs to get the book. We have some here that are signed. You can also do the Amazon. We'd rather get them from you. But yes. Yeah, we'd rather you get them from us too. And <laughs> if anyone's interested, we can put some together and give them to the the museum. You know, we can kind of try to work something out like that if that's possible. Okay, Joy, we can certainly communicate with members about that. And then, hey, I could make a trip to Gulfport to pick those up. <laughs> <laughs> You've been, you've been threatening that for a couple of years. Well, I know. We've tried to ha have a get-together, and we never have. So I'm going to make that date, and I put me down for one of those books for sure. Okay. Any Thank other you. comments or questions? Well, I just did know what Terry had to say about the, uh, the exhibit. Again, fantastic, and was so uh, delightful to have both of you there for our grand opening. You were, you were definitely both... Uh, big hits that day so we appreciate that and yeah we can uh, have a sign up sheet if those of you who'd like to get the book uh, we'll arrange to make a trip down there I know Harry can drag me down there every now and then you know we love golf court so um, <laughs> but we, we look forward to seeing you again and yeah definitely um, Joy chooses our programming and um, except uh, one thing I'll mention is that I choose the programming for the Friends of the Island Parks. <laughs> and so I'm going to be looking for uh, some a presenter for that. So I will be in touch with you soon with my calendar in hand. And uh, again, uh, just a delightful program. Uh, I can't believe how fast the time went by. I was going like, no, Elizabeth, no, you, your clock must be fast. I know. <laughs> when you said you got to you got to pick it up, and I thought, what is she talking about? <laughs> it's, yeah, we can talk all night. Yeah. So that's fabulous. <laughs> I have a question for the Trapmans. Please. I, I wasn't going to bring this up, but since nobody else has said it, uh, I'm assuming it's just the magic of technology, but how is it that the the sketches or drawings or paintings of the animals were put onto a photographic background that's so realistic that I'm sure you didn't paint with all those, you know, palms and bushes and everything. How was, how was that achieved? What it is, is I'm really interested in Florida's environments. And for me, fossil hunting, uh, I started fossil hunting when I was a kid. Uh, fossil hunting in Florida uh, wasn't really about finding uh, bits and pieces of prehistoric animals, although that's nice. 
uh, it was really about what do the prehistoric animals tell us about the environments. Florida, like I said, geologically, Florida is incredible, but when you really think about it, uh, environmentally, Florida is incredible. I mean, we're very close to the tropics, and we share some of the plants with some of the uh, tropical areas to the south of us, like Cuba and places like that. And so, uh, I, I know this seems like a, large, a long answer, but I started out by actually trying to paint, trying to do the artwork that described these environments. And I felt like I wasn't doing a, a, a good job, that I wasn't really giving it the best. So what I thought I'd do is I'd go out and locate environments, actual environments that are still there, that would be indicative of the environments that were here at that time. And Elizabeth has helped me a lot with that because she likes photography. And so we'd go out together and she would photograph some of the environments that I really wanted to put animals into. And we'd sometimes meet people out there in the forest and we'd start joking that we'd we say, were... Do you see that uh, uh, mammoth over there? Yeah, we'd start joking <laughs> we about that we were putting these animals in that kind of environment. But what I do is uh, very carefully I try to uh, make sure that the background and the animals uh, fit together. Uh, you know, I've, I've been doing oil painting for most of my life and so uh, I know how to blend things pretty well. And I do the same thing on a computer that I would have done on a canvas. And that's very, very thoughtful and careful blending. And the other thing is, is that uh, colors in the environment have a tendency to uh, mix together. So that, you know, if you, look like a, if you look at a human face outside and you really look carefully, you'll see that there are uh, slight greens or blues in their face, especially if they're near foliage. And so I'm always uh, conscious of all those kind of little things that have to go in to make uh, an animal fit properly into the environment. But those are the correct environments. The environments that these animals are in in the background, those are the correct environments for, for those animals. Okay, so they were photographs then oh, that you oh, superimposed or whatever. Oh, okay. Oh. So I just wanted to add that I, I could tell later on that the bottom of your border of those um, pictures uh, was a, um, a type of matting, I guess, that you have that's like a, a brown, I mean, a gray, blackish, um, you know, modeled looking kind of thing and I thought it was kind of funny because there was a mammoth and I think there was um, maybe one of the big cats you could see the border and it almost looked like they were standing on the side of the macadam road on a highway yeah. <laughs> yeah. and I right. thought maybe you need to prop that up a little bit because <laughs> I'm sure that's not where they were <laughs> no. but that's uh, actually what that is is that's a, a hash a shell hash from um, northern Florida up around uh, St. Augustine. And what I did is I photographed it and then uh, through the magic of the computer, it just turns into a, a lot of pebbly looking stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I thought that I, I enjoyed that kind of a border that it looks Yeah, beautiful. yeah. But, but there, were, there were very few McAdam Rhodes. <laughs> <laughs> Not nearly. Thanks enough. again. <laughs> Let me just show here very quickly uh, the website, which is firstfloridafrontiers.org. That's Herman and Elizabeth's site. As you can see, there's just all kinds of writings here about the history through a great many ages. The programs are listed and there's other information and details about their programs. Is there contact information you'd like to share? Sure. Herman's email is hermantrapman at gmail. It's Hi, best to call me. My phone number is 727-744-7051. And then I have an, another website that we use uh, for selling Her Herman's artwork. Um, we don't sell it on our .org, but I do have a, a .com website, and it's just elizabethnewley.com. And if you look under uh, the Herman Trapman section, all his graphics are available as prints and as uh, digital files. So if anybody's interested in those, 
you can get them that way. So that's Elizabeth's site, and of course it has Herman's work as well, and there you have in the chat all kinds of websites and contact information. If it was up to Herman, he wouldn't sell anything. He has... <laughs> He'd hide everything under the bed. <laughs> Lots of wonderful comments in the chat box uh, from everyone who enjoyed the program so much, uh, and ditto. I, I just a beautiful program and and now you've really given us a taste for this and it makes you want to know so much more well thank you thank you very much thank you again elizabeth and herman and thank you joy for once again uh doing such a wonderful job with our meet me at the museum and again for all of you who are on this zoom and if you haven't seen the uh environmental alterations uh this gives you a lot of motivation to come there and see that so thank you all for your support for the Palm Harbor Museum, and we'll see you uh, at the next Meet Me at the Museum. Definitely. And please visit our Facebook page, and here you will find out also about our Bluegrass program. Uh, again, the last Saturday of the month on the website, lots of information in all of these. And by the way, if you don't get the, the newsletter, it is on the site and you can download the most recent, April 2022, as well as a couple of earlier ones. Lots of information on the website that you can discover, but if you ever have questions and want to know more about it, I'll throw in my email in the chat. Always glad to hear from you. Can't thank you all enough for being here. We had a lovely group and we had a few people who couldn't be with us tonight uh, that I promised I would be letting them know when this is edited and up. So it'd be the first thing I edit uh, very soon and I will get it up on YouTube and let you know when it's up. Well, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> and thank you, Terry, for all you did to make this happen as well because it was Terry. Oh, wow. Terry knows Herman and, and suggested this program. So I'm so grateful to you. You did not disappoint. Nope. Herman, that was fantastic. Thank you. Well, we made it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all again. Have a beautiful night.